Hi, good, after good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, I am Barry John Graham. I'm one of uh, NQA's uh, information security assessors. Hopefully, there's a few uh, in attendance who have met already on my travels, uh, and if I haven't, I hope that uh, I'll have the pleasure of meeting you in the future. Today, I'm going to be examining risk assessments and attempting to uncover uh, some common myths surrounding uh, risk as required by the standard. Though this is uh, ISO 27001 specific, uh, the risk process should hopefully be applicable to other management systems you may have or be aspiring to have uh, and assist you in thinking about ways to make this process a part of the fabric of uh, the routine activity of your business. As you've already likely received an email from the brilliant marketing team, I am sure you've already seen the areas we aim to cover, but as way of a refresher, uh, we will be looking today at information security risk management methodology, the identification of information security risks, performing information security risk assessments, the treatment of identified uh, security risks, and reporting of information security risks. In addition, you can also, if you've not already received this, download for free from the NQA website, the uh, ISO 27001 implementation guide, uh, and this should handrail you through how to utilize an effective ISMS. Uh, it's a worthy reference document, and I cannot recommend this highly enough, no matter what level of maturity your system is at. I'm also composing, although it is not yet ready, uh, a guide to the annex controls, and hopefully uh, sometime in the new year, you should receive an email to, to indicate that this has been uploaded and available for you to review. Questions, um, but I would ask if you could keep them towards the end or at least uh, type them in with a view to them being addressed towards the end. Uh, that way, it, there, are, there are some parts of this brief, obviously, that may answer your question the further we go into it. Um, there'll be ample time at the end once we've finished to, to pick up these questions. Um, so don't worry if we, if we skip something uh, you want to pick up later. I'm available for you then. Finally, um, just as a way of reminder again, uh, you will receive a full copy of this recording and the presentation along with the slide deck once the webinar is complete. Well, now that we've made the introductions, let's commence with the presentation. Okay, the NQA marketing stuff now. Um, we've got offices across the globe uh, and experience stacked in all of them. So you're in good hands. You can see here, we work with a variety of clients from single management systems to complex multi-site organizations. NQA is able to tailor uh, their approach to support each individual client and make sure uh, a unique price promise because the customers is met. So then, as way of an outline, we'll look at the following areas. Information security risk management methodology are the rules for conducting the risk assessment. <clears throat> now, these are your rules. Uh, they're specific to your business, which obviously can differ from industry to industry and from sector to sector. The identification of information security risks. Uh, this is what kind of things are threats or what can be classed as threats. Performing uh, information security risk assessments. These are things to consider when performing your risk assessments. The treatment of information security risks. Uh, this is what to do to control the risks. And there are four options available, and we'll look at those in detail. However, how you treat the risks is entirely up to you. And again, this is based upon individual needs or your industry or sector and the sensitivity of the nature of the risk, for example. And then finally, reporting. How to report on the risk you've identified to avoid the risk being overlooked or, or deemed too complicated. ISO um, 27001 formally specifies a information security management system, or ISMS, a suite of activities concerning the management of information risks, which are called information security risks within the standard. The ISMS is an overarching management framework through which the organization can identify, analyze, and address its information risks. The ISMS ensures that the security arrangements are fine-tuned to keep pace with changes to the security threats, vulnerabilities, and business impacts, an important aspect in such a dynamic field, and a key advantage of ISO 27001 flexible risk-driven approach. 
The standard covers all types of organizations from commercial enterprises, government agencies, charities, nonprofits, and all sizes, from micro businesses to huge multinational corporations, and all industries and markets, for example, retail, banking, defense, healthcare, education, and government. It's clearly a very wide brief. ISO 27001 is an information security standard that helps companies come into compliance with international best practice models. The standard covers three key components of data security, the people, processes, and technology. When steps are taken to safeguard data with these three components in mind, businesses are better equipped to protect information, mitigate risk, and rectify procedures that are deemed ineffective. As such, a growing consensus has emerged in the corporate sector that deems ISO 27001 to be the gold standard in best practice schemes. By putting this standard into effect, an organization activates an information security management system that works within the business culture of the company in question. The standard is regularly updated and enhanced, and these ongoing improvements allow the ISMS to stay abreast both of changes both within and outside of the company, all the while spotting and eliminating any new risk. It's designed to support the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your information and help you maintain legal compliance. It helps you to protect your data from cyber crimes, from misuse, fire, theft, and other threats. Having a certified ISMS in place will give your customers more confidence in your company, as well as improve your relationships with other stakeholders and help you to mitigate risk. A common example of confidentiality would be an online transaction conducted over secure methods, such as the use of encryption, whereby information is protected via HTTPS. As for integrity, an example would be the trustworthiness of customer financial account information, for example, bank accounts or personal information, which are held by a bank for conducting daily operational transactions. Availability. Now, this could be the bank's customer-facing web servers that host the online banking portal for which customers can access any time of the day. The definitions, then. According to ISO 27000, Information Technology Security Techniques, ISMS Overview and Vocabulary, the key risk assessment, the assessment and management of information security risks is at the core of this standard, 27001. A systematic approach to ISMS is, is necessary to identify organizational needs regarding information security requirements and to create an effective ISMS. This approach should be suitable for the organization's environment and, in particular, should be aligned with the overall enterprise risk management. Security efforts should address risk in an effective and timely manner where and when they are needed. Information security risk management should be an integral part of all information security management activities and should be applied both to the implementation and the ongoing operation of an ISMS. Risk management should be a continuous process. It should never end. The process should establish the internal and external context, assess the risks, treat the risks, using a risk treatment plan to implement recommendations and decisions. Risk management analysis and what can happen and what the possible consequences can be before deciding on what should be done and when and this will reduce the risk to an acceptable level. Information security risk management, as seen on screen, you'll see the major con contributory considerations. We will examine consequence and likelihood in more detail and try to illustrate how this applies to your business. Some more factors are listed on this slide. You will notice a recurring theme of, of monitor and review. Monitor and review. So this, again, re-emphasizes the point that it's an ongoing process requiring constant analysis. Risk management is not a one-time thing. So 
So now we'll look at risk methodology. <clears throat> this is the first step on your voyage through risk management. You need to define rules on how you're going to perform the risk management because you want your whole organization to do it in the same way. The biggest problem with risk assessment happens if different parts of the organization perform things in a different way. There's got to be uniformity. The external and internal context for information security risk management should be established, which involves setting the basic criteria necessary for information security risk management. It is essential to determine the purpose of the information security risk management as this affects the overall process and the context establishment in particular. We'll have a look at risk management approach now in more detail. Depending upon the scope and the objectives of the risk management, different approaches can be applied. The approach can also be different for each iteration. An appropriate risk management approach should be selected or developed that addresses basic criteria such as risk acceptance criteria, risk evaluation criteria, and impact type criteria. Additionally, the organization should assess whether necessary resources are available to perform a risk assessment process and establish a treatment plan to define and implement policies and procedures, including the implementation of the controls which are selected, monitor those controls, and then finally, monitor the information security risk management process. And now we'll look at risk evaluation criteria. Risk evaluation criteria should be developed for evaluating the organization's information security risk and consider the following. The strategic value of the business information process, the criticality of the information assets involved, and the operational and business importance, availability, confidentiality, and integrity. Stakeholders' expectations and perceptions and negative consequences for goodwill and reputation must also be considered. Finally, risk evaluation criteria can be used to specify priorities for risk treatment. So looking at impact criteria. Impact criteria should be developed and specified in terms of the degree of damage or cost to the organization caused by an information security event, which considers the following. The level of classification of the impacted information asset. Breaches of information security, for example, the loss of confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Impaired operations, whether this is internal or to third parties. The loss of business and financial value. Disruptions of plans, projects or deadlines. And the damage of reputation. All of these have been highlighted fairly recently and in fairly uh, well documented ways for some pretty big organizations. So it's important that this get right. Now look at acceptance criteria. Risk acceptance criteria should be developed and specified. Risk acceptance criteria often depends on the organization's policies, goals, objectives, and the interests of stakeholders. An organization should define its own individual scales for the levels of risk acceptance. It cannot be universal across all, all businesses and organizations. The following should be considered during development. Risk acceptance criteria can include multiple thresholds with a desired target level of risk, but provision for senior managers to accept risks above this level under defined circumstances, with emphasis on defined circumstances. Risk acceptance criteria can be expressed as the ratio of estimated profit uh, or other business benefit to the estimated risk. Different acceptance criteria can apply to different class of risk and risk acceptance criteria can include requirements for future additional treatment. An example being, a risk can be accepted if there is approval and commitment to take action to reduce it to an acceptable level within a defined time period. So it might not be immediate, but something projected further into the future, as long as it's recorded. Risk, risk acceptance criteria can differ according to how long the risk is expected to exist. For example, 
the risk can be associated with a temporary or short-term activity. Acceptance criteria should be set up considering the following. Uh, as seen on screen, business criteria, operations, technology, finance, and social and humanitarian factors. So, this is the methodology. These are the rules which govern how you intend to identify risks, who you will assign the risk ownership to, how risks affect uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the information, and the method of calculating the estimated damage of each scenario and the likelihood of it occurring. And again, if this isn't clear on the first run, then obviously a, a review of the slide deck, once you receive it, will hopefully bring it to life. But any questions, again, ask them at the end or reach me by email and we'll go through this. So then, the purpose of risk identification is to determine what can happen to cause a potential loss and to try and gain insight into how, where and why this loss can happen. Risk identification should include risks whether or not the source is under the control of the organization, even though the risk source or cause is perhaps not evident. Identifying the risks that can affect the, the, the confidentiality, integrity and availability of information is the most time consuming part of the risk assessment process, or certainly should be, which follows an asset based approach can help uh, developing a list of information assets is a good place to start. But if you can find an existing list, most of the work is done already. An asset is anything that has value to an organization and which therefore requires protection. For the identification of assets, please bear in mind that an information system consists of more than hardware and software. You know, for example, people are an asset. Asset identification should be performed at a suitable level of detail that provides sufficient information for the risk assessment to take place. The level of detail used on the asset identification influences the overall amount of information collected during the risk assessment. This level can be refined further in future iterations of the risk assessment process. An asset owner should be identified for each asset to provide responsibility and accountability. The asset owner perhaps does not have property rights to the asset, but has responsibilities for its production, development, maintenance, uh, use and security as appropriate. The asset owner is often the most suitable person to determine the asset's value to the organization, but it doesn't always have to be this case. A threat has the potential to harm these assets, such as information processes and systems, and therefore organizations as a whole. Threats can be of natural or human origin and can be accidental or deliberate, i.e. malicious. Both accidental and deliberate threat sources should be identified. A threat can arise from within or external to an organization. Threats should be identified generically and by type, for example, unauthorized actions, physical damage and technical failure. Then, once you've identified where appropriate individual threats within the generic class is identified. This means that no threat is overlooked, including the unexpected, but the volume of work required is limited. Some threats can affect more than one asset. In such cases, they can cause different impacts depending upon which assets are affected. Input to the threat identification and estimate, estimation of likelihood of occurrence can be obtained from the asset owners or users, from human resource staff, from facility management uh, and information security specialists. There's a whole body of people that can have a part in this process. I've not listed them all uh, to exhaustion. Aspects of environment and culture should also be considered when addressing threats. Internal experience from incidents and past threat assessments should be considered in the current assessment. Vulnerabilities can be identified uh, in the following areas within the organization, its processes and procedures, management routines, the personnel employed, the physical environment in which an organization exists, information system configuration, hardware, software, or communications equipment, and dependence on third parties or external bodies. The presence of a vulnerability does not cause harm in itself, as there needs to be a threat present to exploit the vulnerability. A vulnerability that has no corresponding threat may not require the implementation of a control, but should be recognized and monitored for changes. It should be noted here that an incorrectly implemented or malfunctioning control or control being used incorrectly can in itself become a vulnerability. 
A control can be effective or ineffective depending upon the environment in which it operates. Conversely, a threat that does not have a corresponding vulnerability may not result in a risk. Analyze risks. So finally, you must identify the threats and vulnerabilities that apply to each asset. For example, if the threat is, for example, theft of a mobile device, the vulnerability is lack of formal policy for mobile devices or mobile device policy. After you've done this, you should assign an impact and likelihood. The values are based on your risk criteria. You could use severity instead of impact, probability instead of likelihood. The terminology is down to you and how you control it and what you are comfortable with. Once you've known your rules, you can start finding out which potential problems could happen to you. You need to list all of your assets, then threats and vulnerabilities related to those assets. Assess the impact and likelihood for each combination of asset threats, vulnerability, and finally calculate the overall level of risk. Companies are usually, excuse me, companies are usually aware of only 30 to 50 percent of their overall risk. Therefore, you'll probably find this kind of exercise quite revealing. When you finish, you'll start to appreciate the effort you've made and then pick up uh, right from the beginning again about additional risks you need to consider. We'll go with an example now as, as way of illustration. In this example, one asset may have numerous threats with a number of vulnerabilities as demonstrated on screen. The key thing is to identify all risks associated with a certain asset and also the vulnerability posed by these risks. You need to weigh each risk against your predetermined level of acceptable risk, for example, your risk appetite. And once done, you determine which risks you need to address and which ones you can ignore. Well, not ignore, but certainly treat last. This is a common example, which I see on my, on my travels, um, a five by five matrix. Um, I've seen other examples such as uh, three by three, to keep it simple, or 10 by 10, uh, because the spectrum required against those particular organizations is required to be as such. It needs to fit and work for whatever organization you're in and um, however you want this presented to your management. So here, the five by five matrix with the impact along the side, uh, measuring one to five and likelihood uh, along the horizontal, again, measuring one to five. Using the table, you can determine the overall risk rating as being high, medium or low. So when conducting a risk assessment, it can be either a quantitative or qualitative risk analysis. Quantitative risk analysis uses a scale with uh, tangible numerical values rather than descriptives for both consequences and likelihood and use data from a variety of sources. The quality of the analysis depends on the accuracy and completeness of the numerical values and the validity of the models in place. Quantitative risk analysis in most cases uses historical incident, providing the advantage it can be related directly to the information security objectives and concerns of an organization. A disadvantage is the lack of such data on new risks or information security weaknesses. A further disadvantage of the quantitative approach can occur when factual auditable data is not available, thus creating almost an illusion of worth and an accuracy of risk assessment. In financial terms, quantitative risk assessments include a calculation of the single loss expectancy of monetary value of an asset, for example. The way in which consequences and likelihood are expressed and the ways in which they are combined to provide a level of risk will vary according to the type of risk and the purpose for which the risk assessment output is to be used. The uncertainty and variability of both consequences and likelihood should be considered in the analysis and communicated effectively. The second uh, method, uh, qualitative analysis, it uses the scales of qualifying attributes to describe the magnitude of potential consequences, for example, low, medium, high, and the likelihood that those consequences will occur. An advantage of qualitative analysis is the ease of understanding by all relevant personnel, while a clear disadvantage is the dependence on subjective choice of the scale. 
These scales can be adapted or adjusted to suit the circumstances and different descriptions can be used for different risks. Qualitative risk analysis can be used as an initial screening activity to identify risks that require more detailed analysis, where this kind of analysis is appropriate for decision making, and where numerical data or resources are inadequate for quantitative risk analysis. Qualitative analysis should use factual information and data where it is available. Assigning probability and impacts to risks is a subjective exercise. Some of this subjectivity can be eliminated by developing rating scales that are agreed upon by the organization. In general, an organization must define impact and likelihood levels that are relevant to your business. ISO 27001 and 27005 do not state whether these levels should be qualitative or quantitative, high to low, one to five, one to 100, or any other scale. The most important thing is that people understand the scoring in business terms and apply it to the organization in which they exist. Impact is usually measured in terms of CIA and may include financial, reputational and regulatory impact, also information security and operational impacts. Once you've analyzed your risks, you need to evaluate them to establish whether they fit in terms of your risk appetite. Only once you've done this can you decide the appropriate way to treat each risk. This means you should be able to quickly identify your highest risks and create a prioritized list of which risks to address and in what order to address them. It's particularly important to identify whether or not the risk falls within or outside your predetermined level of acceptable risk. When risk owners say that they will accept a risk of, for example, nine, they must be prepared to accept a business situation such as the loss of X amount of thousands of pounds every year rather than the less relevant impact of three likelihood of three. In practice there is a link between impact and threat and vulnerability and likelihood as similar threats tend to produce impacts on business and similar vulnerabilities produce similar likelihoods. Impact types could include human, financial, legal, regulatory, reputational and operational and again not an exhaustive thing. Likelihood factors could include frequency of occurrence, previous occurrence, current levels of security controls in place, size of the attack group, or knowledge of vulnerability. So on screen, um, hopefully, uh, we'll bring some of this to light and what we've covered and provide an approximate guide to help you visualize um, your own business risks. So you can see there's a there's a example of a spectrum given there of, of um, potential impact and, and what it looks like in terms of qualitative and quantitative measure. Of course, not all risks are created equally. You have to focus on the most important ones, the so-called unacceptable risks. There are four options you can choose from to, to mitigate each acceptable, unacceptable risk you've identified. The first is modify, apply security controls from Annex A of 27001 to decrease these risks. The second is to transfer the risk to another party, for example, an insurance company or buying an insurance policy. The third is to avoid the risk by stopping whichever activity you've deemed to be too risky or, or doing that activity in a completely different fashion. And the fourth is to accept the risk if, for example, the cost of mitigating a risk would be higher than the damage caused by uh, risk realization. This is where um, there's a bit of artwork to be done and, and individuals need to get creative, uh, how to decrease the risks with minimum investment. It would be easiest if everybody had an unlimited budget, as, as I'm sure you all know, that is never gonna happen. And I tell you that unfortunately your management is right. It is possible to achieve uh, the same result with less money. You just gotta figure out how. So the first option uh, we'll examine is treat. This is the process used to ensure information risks are reduced to an acceptable level. The actions taken should be in line with the level of risk posed to the information assets, and normally by adding, adding strengthening security controls that will reduce either likelihood or vulnerability. So within Annex A of ISO 27001, uh, there is a list of control measures, um, the, the headline uh, for each Annex area on screen there. Um, clause 6.13 um, 
describes how an organization can respond to risk with a risk treatment plan. Uh, an important part of this is choosing appropriate controls. So within an IOK, there are 114 controls in 14 clauses and 35 control categories. Some of those are shown on screen, but very briefly, I'll, I'll handrail through them all. Uh, A5 is, is information security policies. It outlines uh, how the policies are written and reviewed. Uh, the organization of information security, A6, controls and how the responsibilities are assigned. A7 controls prior to, prior to employment, during and after employment in terms of human resourcing. Asset management at A8 controls uh, re related to the inventory of assets and how they are used and also for information classification and media handling. Access control at A9, which uh, outlines controls for access and access control policy, user access management and application access control. A10, cryptography, which are controls related to encryption and key management. 11, physical and environmental security, uh, controls defining the secure areas, entry systems, uh, protection against uh, environmental threats, equipment security, secure disposal, clear desk, clear screen policy, etc. A12, operational security, uh, lots of controls related to the management of IT production, change management, capacity management, malware, backup, logging, monitoring, installation, vulnerabilities, etc. A13 is communication security, which are related to network security, segregation, network services, transfer of information, electronic messaging, etc. A14, system acquisition, development and maintenance, so controls around um, development and in support processes. A15, supply relationships, controls on what to include in agreements and how to monitor those suppliers. Uh, 16, uh, information, informa information security incident management, which are controls for reporting events and weaknesses, defining responsibilities, uh, response procedures, and collection of evidence to analyze to prevent uh, further incidents in the future. A17, which are um, aspects of business continuity management, which, which require information security controls, um, such as what to do in the event of business continuity plan being enacted, the verification of that plan in between enactments, uh, reviewing uh, and looking at IT redundancy. And finally, A18 compliance, which are controls requiring the identification of, of laws, legislation, regulation, intellectual property protection, personal data protection, etc. etc. The Annex A sets out 114 good practice security controls. The controls use the word should and are neither mandatory nor exhaustive. This means that organizations with different risks will apply these controls to different levels of strength. Although 27001 doesn't require you to use Annex A controls exclusively, you do have to check the controls you selected from elsewhere against those in Annex A to ensure that each risk is appropriately mitigated. Having selected the controls, you need to produce a statement of applicability. This is one of the most important ISO 27001 documents. It outlines it should outline the ident identity of the controls you've selected to address the risks you've identified. It will require you to explain why you've selected them. You're required to state whether or not you've implemented those controls and finally explain why any Annex A controls had been omitted. And they have, I've seen them on my travels. As long as you justify any omission, then everything's okay. There will be at least 114 entries within your SOA, however, one for each Annex A control all of which will include extra information about each control and, ideally, a link to relevant documentation about each control's implementation status. A risk assessment report can be very long, so an SOA is a useful document for everyday operational use, a simple demonstration that controls have been implemented and a useful link to the relevant policies, processes and other documentation and systems that have been applied to treat each identified risk. Think of it as an index to your overall ISMS. This document actually shows the security profile of your company. And this is based on the results of the risk treatment. You need to list all the controls you've implemented, why you've implemented them controls, and how you've done this. The document is also very important because the certification auditor, i.e. me, will use it as a main guideline for the audit. So we've looked at TREAT. Let's examine the rest of them. So share, generally this is done by insuring or outsourcing. Although you would be typically suffer the impact, you can share the risk with somebody else who's in a better place to mitigate the risk. 
This shifts part of the risk to other organizations or contractually to business partners, for example, IT support services is a common one. An organization cannot transfer ownership of the risk, however. So terminate or avoid. This will end the activity or the circumstance which has caused the risk you've identified. For example, you cease to carry out the activity or function or by moving locations. This occurs when there's no cost-effective solution uh, to reduce the risk you've identified. And it may involve choosing an alternative activity that meets the same business need. The final one, uh, tolerate uh, or accept is a common, commonly an acceptance by management that the risk falls within their previously established risk acceptance criteria or via extraordinary decisions. It essentially means that no additional action is required other than what's already in place. Acceptance should draw documentation and communication to senior management to make sure that everybody is aware that this activity has been reviewed and still remains in place. This is the step where you have to move from theory into something tangible and practice. Let's be honest, all, you, all, all you've done up to now is this whole risk management job was purely theoretical, but now it's time to show some concrete results. This is the purpose of the risk treatment plan. This identifies exactly who's going to implement each control, in what time frame, with what budget, etc. The better way of looking at this document would be implementation plan or action plan. But the terminology used is risk treatment plan in the standard, so we'll stick with that for now. Once you've written this document, it's crucial to get your management approval because it will take considerable time and effort and money and resources to implement all of the controls that you've planned here. And without management commitment, you're not likely to realize any change. And this is it. You've started your journey from not knowing how to set up your information security all the way through to having, hopefully, a very clear picture of what you need to implement. The underlying point is that ISO 27001 forces you to make this journey in a systematic way with a step-by-step -step approach. Thank you for listening today. Um, please feel free to ask questions now or to visit our website for any additional content. And please do follow us via any of the social media channels which are highlighted on this slide. You will always find any of us to be open and welcoming. This concludes the webinar. I would be happy to answer any questions you have about ISO 27001, risk or implementation of ISMS. Okay, so we've had a question about um, where you can find the, with the documentation. Um, apologies, it seemed like a couple of people missed that. I cut out temporarily. So um, on the NQA webpage, uh, there is a, a area where you can um, look at ISO 27001 pertinent documents. And within that sector, I believe there is a, a implementation guide. At the moment, it, it just covers clauses um, four through to 10. However, I'm writing an Annex A control to go with that. Uh, so you'll have the full spectrum of things available to you in the future. Okay, one from Lee. Um, a company is mandated to have ISO 27001? Um, the short answer is, is no. Um, you don't have to have ISO 27001. It's undertaking the journey to achieve certification is something that's got to be well considered uh, and applicable for your organization. Um, certainly, you know, from, from experience, it, it certainly highlights your commitment to security and in some circumstances gets you onto the table for tendering for business. Uh, having an ISO certificate uh, attracts all kinds of uh, benefits. Um, so it, it, as long as you've considered that this is what you want to do and you've, you've achieved your desired outcome, you, you know what your objectives are to achieve your desired outcome, then um, yeah, it's something I would, I would recommend clearly, um, but it's not a mandated thing for everybody to have, no. Uh, one from Ayla, uh, apologies if I've butchered your name there. Um, yes, the will. In, in short, um, the entire presentation will be sent to everybody um, listening in now. Uh, that will include a recording of everything we've been through, if you so wish to listen to me again. If not, there is a slide deck that you can handrail slow time and in your own time uh, to make sure you, you've achieved uh, the full benefit of the knowledge uh, available to you. You're welcome. <laughs> And the only outstanding question there is from uh, Violetta. 
again, apologies if I've got your name wrong. You said you've asked, um, I mentioned earlier that theft can not only be a treat, but a, a vulnerability. Uh, can, you, can I elaborate? Yes, of course. So when we examined risk methodology and identification of risk, we had a look at an example of a, a company IT asset, such as a laptop. And we said that theft was a threat, and it is a threat because obviously um, people like to get their hands on laptop. Um, a vulnerability, you know, the vulnerability from the threat of theft could be that you leave your device unattended, or your premises in which that asset is stored is unsecured or does not have a suitable level of control over it. And therefore, yes, the threat of theft, um, the vulnerabilities around it are. Um, a natural follow-on from the threat. So, for example, if you leave your device on the train or where you store the device is not suitably secured. I hope that answered it, but if not, then please do come back to me. And there's, there is a question from a ferry. Please, again, if I got your name wrong, I apologize. Um, so the, the NQA webpage um, highlights all of the forthcoming webinars. In terms of information security, there'll be one on the 10th of January, which addresses the implementation guide to 27701, which is the new standard which, which aligns to personal information management system. There's a, a little bit of a blog entry on the webpage for you to review, which looks at GDPR and why 27701 has been um, um, raised or written by ISO and then I will have a look at that in real life to, to show you how to implement that into your existing information security management system. <laughs> okay Violetta I think um, you've got a couple of questions there that I'll probably email you direct if that's okay and we'll have a conversation via email so I can outline uh, exactly what it is I mean. Uh, so you get the, you know, yeah, I will answer your question, but I'll, I'll come back to you directly to email if that's okay. Okay. So I'm going to remain on the line for just another minute. If there are any other questions, I'll answer them. If not, once again, thank you for listening. And um, hopefully I'll see you very soon. Or if not, you'll hear from me very soon uh, during the next webinar. Okay, guys. Well, thank you for listening. Uh, have a great weekend wherever you are and a good Christmas in the, in the meantime. And I'll speak to you all again, hopefully in January. See you soon. Bye-bye.